So autonomous vehicles, robo taxis, they are going to be coming to the roads of the UK in the not too distant future. This is not just a wild claim, this is fact. Um, the 2024 uh, Autonomous Vehicle Act is already law and under that law the first or fully automated self-driving cars could be on the roads within a matter of months. Now what is still up for discussion is the safety standards for, for these things. Um, how safe are they going to be? What are the implications for motorcyclists going to be? This is a vastly complex area, something that we need to get right. Automated vehicles do have potential. They could actually help to reduce motorcycle casualties on the road uh, by removing driver error. Uh, in theory, Smidzy, Smidzy uh, collision should be reduced uh, if autonomous vehicles take over control of, uh, of driving cars. Um, you know, why shouldn't this be a good thing for motorcyclists? But equally, if we get this wrong, it could be horribly bad for motorcycling. It could be the complete opposite of what we're looking for. So how we respond to this and how we deal with it is of vital importance. Now, the government is currently running a consultation called a call for evidence um, on the automated vehicles statement of safety principles. Now, there was a consultation back in 2022 where they initially brought forward this idea that a autonomous vehicle should meet a safety standard that is equivalent to or better than a, than a safe and competent human driver. Now, at the time, we responded to that consultation saying we weren't overly impressed with that idea. It's far too subjective. Who gets to decide what's a safe and competent human driver? How safe is that? And is that safe enough? Um, Clearly, they took an awful lot of time to consider our response and decided to carry on and write into law that the safety standard was going to be equivalent to a safe and um, careful human driver. So they've written this into the Act, the 2024 Autonomous Vehicle Act, already, so it's already there. But then, strangely, they're then running a consultation to ask people's opinion of what a safe and, uh, a safe and competent human driver is. Now, to me, this seems a little bit um, back to front. Surely you would define what the standard is before you write that into law rather than write the standard into law and then ask everybody, what does this standard actually mean? But um, that's maybe that's just me. I don't know. Um, seems to be a bit of a back to front way of going about things. So... Um, as I say, I'm working on this uh, response for MAG for this consultation. Um, we're obviously not changing our opinion. We don't think that the uh, the safety standard is correct. We think it should be a statistical based standard uh, that is actually measurable and can actually be proven to be the case with, with these automated vehicles rather than it being a subjective uh, standard that doesn't really mean an awful lot. So we are obviously responding to this. Um, now, I've taken part in a roundtable meeting with uh, with government officials. Uh, it was a roundtable meeting for vulnerable road user groups. Obviously, they are, I was there representing motorcycling. Um, and to be fair, I think they recognise that there is problems with this safety standard of a safe and competent human driver. They understand that you know, it's a little bit woolly and it needs to be tied down a bit. So I think there's a certain amount of understanding there that, yes, there's work that needs to be do it, done. But bearing in mind that the Act is already in place and cars could, in theory, be signed off before we've completed this discussion is a little bit worrying, in my view. Um, as I say, the government officials were listening to what I had to say and what others were saying, um, and these concerns that are being raised, they're certainly not unique to MAG, they're certainly not unique to other road user groups either. I think there's a large amount of concern around this. Um, but we've got to take a close look at what what it is that we can put in a consultation response that is constructive we don't want to be purely obstructive by saying no we're totally opposed to autonomous vehicles when potentially they could actually be a benefit for us as motorcyclists if they reduce the number of collisions with us um, uh, that that should be a good thing naturally there's a certain question is that autonomous vehicles when it comes to motorcycles i don't believe anybody is ever going to want or buy or purchase an autonomous motorcycle what is the point um we ride a motorcycle because we enjoy riding motorcycles we don't ride a motorcycle because we want the most convenient way of being delivered from a to b 
not the same with cars, but that's the case for motorcycles. So I think, yeah, autonomy is something that is always going to be an edge case. There is always going to be a mix on the roads where you've got human controlled vehicles, especially motorcycles and autonomous vehicles, both operating in the same space. And one of the red lines that we've put forward throughout this process is that we want the autonomous vehicles to adapt to the human driver. We can't expect the human driver or the human rider, in our case, to adapt to the EV or to the uh, the autonomous vehicle. Um, this should be a case of, yes, we, we, we accept that the autonomous vehicles could have a safety benefit, but we don't want to see segregated lanes created for them to make them work properly or anything like that, because that will mean less road space for motorcyclists and therefore greater risks for us when uh, pushed into closer proximity with other vehicles. So yes, there is a trade-off. Uh, we want to see safety improvements, but we don't want to see it done at, this, at the expense of motorcyclists. So the safety standard, obviously this comes in two parts because there's a safety standard for pre-deployment. So that's basically signing off a fleet of autonomous vehicles to say that they are safe to be used on the road. And then there's the in-use safety standard, which is actually measuring their performance when they're actually on the roads. Now, of course, this is a fascinating problem because how do you actually determine how safe an, auto or, uh, an autonomous vehicle is before it's actually in a real world situation? Now, the method that's going to be used for, for, for determining this is uh, modelling and um, scenarios that are run through uh, with these autonomous vehicles and they test those in those certain scenarios. But of course, this is where part of the problem arrives. If they say that they're going to make road safety better for all road users, we know what often happens when people talk about all road users. We've seen this happen with local transport plans, for example, which should cover all road users. They forget to fact the fact that motorcycles exist in 25% of those local transport plans. That's a fact. That's proven. You can look it up. We've got all the information on, on the MAG website about that. So if we say that the safety has got to be right for all vehicles, will they actually remember that motorcycles exist? So what we're calling for is some specificity where it specifically says all vehicles and it must include motorcycles. Now, again, this may seem like a nuanced argument. What's the difference between all vehicles or all vehicles, including motorcycles? It's just words. Yes, it is just words, but it could have a major impact on the outcomes. Now, when you look at it, when um, the, the, there's one line of argument that suggests that there's actually not a need for um, a safety standard for these autonomous vehicles because the liability goes with the manufacturer and the manufacturer is obviously not going to be wanting to create um, costs for their business by having accidents and insurance claims against them. So they're going to make the vehicles as safe as they possibly could be um, without a, a government regulation. But of course, what you then have to remember is that these manufacturers, they're manufacturing aut autonomous cars, they're not manufacturing autonomous motorcycles. So their focus and what's going to be in their mind, the thing that, that you know protects their profit margin, is whether or not these things can detect other, other vehicles of the same type, cars, lorries, buses, whatever it may be. Yes, there'll be plenty of noise and people shouting about pedestrians and cyclists, but if we as motorcyclists don't shout up, we could very easily get overlooked. We've seen it happen before. It's not beyond the realms of possibility that yeah, motorcycle safety does get overlooked. And when you're looking at the, you know, the detection systems on these auto autonomous vehicles, we're already seeing plenty of evidence to suggest that their, you know, their radar, their lidar, whatever system they're using, doesn't always accurately detect the presence of a motorcycle which means that yeah you can get a tesla driving into the back of a motorcycle on the on a highway in america it's happened before multiple times this is a this is a problem um now you could argue well yeah but that's the level of a competent human driver isn't it because we'll get human drivers driving into the back of motorcycles on straight roads just the same so yeah if we set this standard as this is the standard is that just baking in the problems that we've already got by making these autonomous vehicles only as good as a human driver. Don't we want an autonomous vehicle that is better than a human driver? So yeah, there's there's all sorts of nuances and, and ways that you can approach this. Um, but yes, I, I do believe that there needs to be a much firmer 
um, more specific um, safety standard that is used for signing off a fleet of autonomous vehicles to say that they're safe to be used on the roads in the UK. And that point about being safe to be used on the roads in the UK is also quite an interesting one. Because what you have to remember is the manufacturers of these vehicles, they're making vehicles for the world market or, you know, maybe the American market or the European market. But the rules of the roads change in all these different locations. Now, one of the factors that is often sold as a selling point for autonomous vehicles is that if one vehicle makes a mistake and learns from that mistake, that, that learning can then be applied to all the vehicles in the fleet. Job done, everybody's learned, and the standard increases. But what if that autonomous vehicle learns a lesson in an area where the rules of the road are different to where your vehicle is operating? And even within the within the UK, when it comes to motorcycle policy, we know that some councils will allow access for motorcycles in bus lanes and others won't. So when you cross a border from one, one county to the next or one London borough to the next, the rules of the road actually change. So how do autonomous vehicles actually deal with that? How is that going to be worked into the system? Do we need a UK specific set of scenarios that, that, that are tested? And do those need to be then shielded so that those autonomous vehicles that are operating in the UK do not pick up learning from other countries? So there's vast complexity in all this. How is this all going to fit together? We've got to play a role in making sure that the right answers come out at the other end. So that's the pre-deployment section of the, of the safety standard. Then you've got the post-deployment, which is actually measuring their performance and making sure that they do actually perform to the level that they, the manufacturers claim. So we need to have statistical information about the number of collisions between autonomous vehicles and other vehicle types. And again, this needs to be very specific because it needs to rule out or it needs to disaggregate the, the numbers so that we can see specifically for motorcyclists what's the impact for motorcyclists, not just a generic number for all road users. Now, why do we say this? This is because obviously motorcyclists as a minority road user group, you can have, have uh, more accidents for motorcyclists, um, which say doubles the number of motorcycle fatalities, but a 20% reduction in car fatalities because there's far more car fatalities in total. That means that overall the number of casualties on the road system has gone down. But what's happened is the number of car fatalities have gone down, but motorcycle fatalities have gone up. We cannot allow that situation to arise, which means that you need very clear information, very clear data collected that shows which are the, which are the vehicles uh, that are involved in the collisions and who's the people who are actually coming out worst. Is it motorcyclists, is it cyclists, pedestrians, car drivers, whatever it may be. If we don't break these numbers down well enough, we'll be in the dark on all this stuff. And you also need to look at the culpability. Is it is it actually the human road user that was at fault or was it the autonomous vehicle that was at fault? Because that is going to impact on, on the results. It may be that, you know, human car drivers are driving into autonomous vehicles and they sign this off as, well, that's not really a problem because it's the human driver that's a problem. But those old, same autonomous vehicles are then driving into motorcyclists and you're just assuming that it's the motorcyclist's fault. We can't have that happening either, can we? So, yes, this is a vastly complex area that we need to give an awful lot of thought to. As I say, we can't just go in and say, yes, we're, we're opposed to all this and, and be, be obstructive. We've got to come up with practical, meaningful solutions to all this because there is an opportunity cost in getting this wrong. In theory, autonomous vehicles... Um, you know, with 360 degree awareness, uh, they don't get tired, they don't, uh, they don't have uh, drink alcohol, all these things, all these human factors that can be removed from the safety equation should in theory make motorcycling less risky. Now we know that motorcyclists are the road user group that are at most risk on the roads. Um, and this is why, you know, our position is that, yeah, these vehicles could actually be a benefit to motorcyclists. So we shouldn't rule these things out, but we need to make sure that these processes are done in a way that actually highlights the issues for motorcyclists rather than just glosses over them. So the consultation, it is open. It, it was published on the 10th of June. As I say, I'm working very hard looking at all the uh, the, the questions. There's 42 questions in this um, survey that they've done. 
Um, obviously that means that there's an awful lot of work, an awful lot of thought that needs to go into it. There's an awful lot of research that I'm carrying out about academic papers that have looked in it. And, and to be fair, when you look at the academic, the body of academic work, it shows that the, the thoughts that I'm having have actually been picked up by the academic world. There are papers out there that say that we need disaggregated data to show the impact on the different road user types. It, there is academic papers out there that, that says it would not be acceptable for one road, road for one road user group to be disadvantaged while others see an advantage from autonomous vehicles. So what we're coming up with here is not something that is outlandish and off the page. These things are being thought about and by the academic people that are looking into this. So you know, I don't think this is a hopeless situation. This is one where we can we can play a positive role in getting the best outcome for motorcyclists if we put things together properly. But as I say, this is very complex work. I'm spending an awful lot of time looking and digging into the details, but I also want to hear your opinions because I'm genuinely interested. I know there's concerns about autonomous vehicles. I share those concerns, but if we can get this right, this could actually be a positive for motorcycling in the future. So please do um, take the time to put, put some thoughts in, into the comments think it through by all means respond to the consultation yourself it's open to members of the public as well as uh, organizations such as mag um, i'll put a link for for this consultation uh, and it runs through until i think it's the first of september it closes let me check uh, respond Yes, yeah, so, so the consultation, it began on the 10th of June 2025 and it runs through until 23.59 on the 1st of September. So there is time for you to respond. But as I say, please also put in the comments, put your thoughts to, to us. Uh, let us see what's in your head. It may be that somebody comes up with a bright idea that I haven't thought of. It may be that somebody raises a concern that I hadn't considered. So there's all these things. Uh, we need this response to be as comprehensive and as user-friendly as possible. We want to make sure that everybody's views are taken into account, which means that you need to get in touch and let us know what your views are. So please do put something down in the comments below. Let us know what you think. By all means, drop us an email, however you feel is easiest to do it, but communicate with us. What are your thoughts? How safe should these vehicles be? How do we make sure that there's a standard in place that ensures that motorcycle safety is a priority in this? Um, and yeah, any ideas and suggestions that we can put forward, we're always happy to listen to them. So thanks for your time, and I look forward to reading all the comments.